chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Those of you who are constantly want to thank those of you who are visiting. I see a few faces that are familiar. We thank God for your presence this evening. And we hope that you, it will be a lesson to you to study. We are dealing with the book of Philippians for the entire month of October. Our study is one of what we call an examination or a survey of this particular book. A survey is not as in-depth per se as a exegetical look. The word exegesis, which we want to find out in just a moment, means something a little different. But I hold that back. That's going to be a teaser for you. Amen. Amen. Philippians chapter 2, if you have it, the Bible reads, beginning in verse number 1, If there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Now, we said this morning, in terms of understanding this passage, one has to understand the context before you can respect the content. In other words, not knowing the background and the reason why Paul writes this letter uh, will sort of leave us in the dark and will kind of uh, sort of, you know, search for understanding. Uh, even though sometimes we understand the passage, we don't understand the reason. Anytime you read a letter by Paul or Peter or one of the apostles, it's what's called an occasional letter. An occasional letter. Now, the word occasion doesn't mean he just wrote it because it was Christmas Eve or he wrote it because it was Easter. Uh, the word occasion means there was something about a situation uh, that caused the writer to write about something. And so in theological circles, that's known as an occasional letter. Uh, most of your 16 letters written by Paul are occasional letters. Jude was an occasional letter. Uh, Galatians. Romans, all these had to deal with issues in the church, unless they were written directly to a person. And even then, they were instructive or doctrinal issues, okay? So when you look at Philippians, and please feel free to stop and just raise your hand and acknowledge you. Uh, if you look at Philippians chapter 2, Paul begins in chapter 1 writing to this church. He's 700 miles away in prison in a Roman cell. Uh, he's manacled to uh, Roman soldiers, 12 hours a day. They switch them out every 12 hours. So he's tied to them. He's preaching the gospel. And then once they change ships, he's preaching to somebody else. So even in a bad situation, Paul does not use that as an excuse not to preach the gospel. And if you learn nothing else, I think that's something that we can take with us. No matter how bad your situation is, no matter how tied up you may think you are, you can always teach somebody about the gospel. Because some of us use every excuse in the book, don't we? I don't know enough. You've been in the church for 30 years, you still don't know it. Hmm. Either something's wrong with that minister, <laughs> or you may need to change congregations. Uh, all you have to do is tell somebody how you got saved. Mm -hmm. That's all you got to do. You don't have to break down the text in the Hebrew and the Greek and Talk about the Latin. You don't have to do any of that. Just teach them what you know. All right? All right. Now look at chapter 2 again. He says, Paul says, fulfill my joy. I want you to underline, fulfill my joy. What does he mean by that? Paul has a joy that's not rooted in circumstance. Paul has a joy that goes beyond uh, his, his, his context in terms of him being in jail. And I appreciate Paul for that because Paul does not let others dictate to him how he should feel. Uh, Paul, I've used this before, Paul is a thermostat and not a thermometer. A thermostat sets the temperature, right? This morning it was a little warm in here because somebody didn't set the thermostat, apparently. I didn't put it on too high. So we were sweating, at least I was. <laughs> a thermometer gauges how high it is. But a thermometer can change depending on the context. And that's how our lives are. Even sometimes we, we're happy because we got a paycheck. Two days later, after all the bills have been paid, you, you, you're back down to being sad again, right? Because <laughs> there's no more money in the bank. 
That's a thermometer. Thermostat says, I'm going to have joy whether I have it or if I don't have it. Amen. Amen. And so Paul says, I want you to fulfill. I want you to bring this thing up to full. But how do you do that, Paul? Paul says, well, be like-minded. He says, having the same love. We said this morning, that word there is agape. Many of you already know that. But the word love there literally means an action. It's not a feeling. It's not an adjective. So Paul does not say, feel good about what you do. If you don't feel warm and loosely in your heart, then you don't have to do it. Paul says, no, that, that's, not, that's not what I'm dealing with. I'm dealing with circumstance less, if that's a word, uh, desire to do good. And he says, have the same love. If you love yourself, and I think most of us do, right? Some of us might have too much love for ourselves, right? <laughs> but if you love yourself, use that same love when you're dealing with your brothers and sisters. Simple, but I guarantee you it's a hurdle. For most of us, it's easy to love ourselves, because I know what I like, right? I don't know what you like. But Paul says, in order to have this mind that we need to have, I've got to learn to love you. I've said this before. I'm so glad we're not commanded in the Bible to like one another. Y'all can catch on the way home. Amen. Because some of us aren't that easy to like. Let's just be honest. <laughs> but you don't have to like me, but you do have to love me. Praise the Lord. I, I said this one time to me. I said, I'm not here to be like. <laughs> Some of the brothers don't remember that meeting. Amen. But I, I'm not. I, I'm not here to be liked. Uh, I'm here to preach the gospel. And, and as long as I do that, and I stay within those parameters, it doesn't matter what people think about me. Whether in the church or out of church, it doesn't matter to me. It might matter to some people, but it doesn't matter to me. Because nobody in the Bible, if you read the Bible in, from, from Genesis to Revelation, every one of God's prophets this life. You didn't have a popular prophet in the Bible. Jesus came, didn't do anything to anybody. <laughs> Isn't that something? So, so, so people will like you based on circumstance. All right, now, I want to give you some references because uh, some of these things I want you to look up. John chapter 3, verse 29. John chapter 3, verse 29. John chapter 3, verse 29. John chapter 3, verse 29 is in the context of the bride, groom, and his friend. It's interesting. The bridegroom in, in, in the uh, nearest and cold <coughs> was the person that would wait all times of night for the groom to come. In Palestinian weddings, and I think even to the day they still do the same thing, um, they will wait up to midnight and sometimes beyond midnight. Because the groom uh, may be coming, but they don't know what time is coming. You remember the, the five wives and the five foolish virgins? Y'all remember that one? That's, that's where that culture, that, that parable comes from. It comes from the cultural context of the Palestinian wedding. And so in John chapter 3, verse 29, the Bible says, He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but, he that, he, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. And this is my joy, therefore it is fulfilled. John writes to let us know that when we hear of good things, we should rejoice. And Paul's actions uh, really mimic the bridegroom. He's saying, or uh, the bridegroom's friend. He's saying, when you do these things, when you're same mind, same love, you have now fulfilled my joy. You've made me happy just by simply doing the right thing. Any man of God, teaches the people of God, he's extremely happy when he sees God's people doing what they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. There's no big joy. I, I can tell you, I, I've taught for uh, years, 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 years. One of the things I like is what I call the light bulb moment. The moment you can see it to get it. And not just getting it, but living it. You know, it's one thing to, to hold on to an academic, it's another thing for it to be transformative. Mm -hmm. And if the word of God is not transformative, then I, I question uh, either is it being taught right or is it being lived right? <coughs> so you come to church with a lot of information. Go home and just stockpile it, don't do nothing with it. Week after week after week. What God wants you to do 
is he wants you to be changed by the word. If you're not changed by the word, then, then what do you really do? What's, what's the point of coming? Well, I'm serious, what's the point of coming? You, you might as well just stay home and you know, eat some bonbons and you know, get an early nap, get an early jump on Monday, amen? <laughs> but, but here's what God says. God says, he says he wants you to be transformed. Now watch verse number uh, three. It says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. I, I like that term, lowliness of mind, because what Paul is saying again, he's saying that you have to have a humble opinion of yourself. Some of us are no good because we have a high opinion of ourselves. Self-confidence is good, but don't have a high opinion of yourself. Let me give you a few examples. You come to church, things aren't the way you like them to be. <coughs> you got your face like you've been sucking on sour lemons for the remainder of the service. Mm -hmm. You walk past somebody with an attitude, they speak to you, how you doing? Mm -hmm. All because things weren't perfectly set up for you. Don't get me wrong, we all have bad days. Mm -hmm. We all have issues. Every Sunday. Every Sunday we got an issue. That's deep. That's deep. And so the point being is you have to be careful about the fact, do you have an opinion of yourself that's so high that everything has to be your way or the highway? And, and that's what God wants us to see. He wants us to have a low opinion of ourselves. It doesn't mean that we we dog ourselves. We don't think we're smart. We don't think we're good. Look, whatever. He's not talking about that. He's talking about in terms of putting yourself before someone else. All right? All right. Then he says, look at this. Let each do what? Esteem. That means I'm going to lift you up better than themselves. All right? In other words, hold them up to a higher extent, more so than yourself. And you know why it's, it's such a beautiful thing? Because when I do that to Jimmy, that's what Jimmy does to me. He lifts me up. You see what I'm saying? When I do that to Sister Baker, Sister Baker does that to me. It's, it's a cycle. It's a circle. And nobody has to feel bad because we live with each other. Right? Think about how beautiful that is in, in, in a setting like this. And no, you go first. No, no, what you need? No, what you need? <laughs> you know, we fight over each other. How do you help you? I don't know about you, but I like Chick-fil-A. And, and, and there's something about Chick-fil-A service, by and large. You might run into a problem every night. By and large, I would say 8 out of 10. If you go to them, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. I would like a, uh, that number two for $50. And, uh, and you add a couple of, you know, I'm here. $50 like on fire, right? You know, that's kind of high. <laughs> Some of y'all never smile. That's all. <laughs> that's what it's about. Like. And you reach in your pocket, you give me your fifty dollars, and oh, it's good to see you. We have a great day. We need strong, great, you know. And they're all happy and chipper, you know what I mean? And it's amazing. It's amazing what a smile will do. One touch mm -hmm. sometimes, you know. You know, my, my old shop teacher told me, you know, the easiest and cheapest way to improve your looks. Smile. Oh man, I see something. Present passive imperative. And we all know what imperative is, right? 
Mm-hmm. Command. What's in the parish? Command. Command. So it's not uh, a suggestion. If you're a child of God, this passage is just as forceful as the one that says upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread. Mm-hmm. But you know what we'll do? We'll jump on each other. But you know you're supposed to take Lord's Supper. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what you know? You, you didn't get first. You know, we, we commanded. You're not singing. Mm-hmm. Bible says, the command is saved. Mm-hmm. But we'll jump over this one. And it has the same force. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. We are commanded to have the same mind, uh, the same mind Christ had. Mm-hmm. And when we don't do it, guess what? Mm-hmm. It's a sin. Mm-hmm. So what do we have to do? We have to practice it. Well, watch this. It's, it's present, which means it's continual. But it also is passive, which means that it's something that you can't involve yourself in. Personally. A passive verb means something is done unto the subject. Remember we had that in, uh, in, in How to Study Your Bible? Anybody remember that? Right. There's passive, middle, and uh, what they call the, the active voice. This is passive. In other words, it happens when you let this line into you. Some of us don't grow because we don't allow God to work through us. Did you hear what I said? Some of us don't grow because we don't allow God to work through us and in us. You remember, the Bible says, let patience do what? Do a good work. Perfect Perfect works. Right? Mm -hmm. I always wanted to know why they used a feminine term instead of a masculine term. The Bible didn't say let patience have this perfect work. It says, let patience have her. I guess women are more patient. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Let patience have her. This is the way it goes. You're not going to quit. But what happens is, you have to allow it to do something. God is going to work through you. But there has to be an allowance on your end of the scale. That's right. right. Because you can block what God's trying to do. Right. God can make you do it. Mm-hmm. But God never made us robots. He's not going to make you come to worship. you got the right to leave right now. you got the right to whatever you want to do. But the Lord says, I'm going to work with you. We're going to find out over the next Sunday what this is about. Because there's some controversy uh, in, in, in Philippians chapter 2. And uh, we'll, we'll touch on that next week. Lord says the same. But let God work with you. I see him in the back. Uh, is that yeah, I'm, 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 I'm thinking know about this sermon you since this morning. Okay, and that's good. And, and what you just said a minute ago, and, and here's, this is more rhetorical than anything. I keep asking myself this question. What exactly is, or what is he saying, or what is it meaning when he says, let this mind be mm-hmm. You talk about humility. Mm-hmm. I think this is the, the, the probably the best example or, or definition for the word humility. You know? And I think about Jesus when he watched the, the disciples' feet. Absolutely. In your sermon this morning, you use the illustration. You use it before where Jesus was equal to God, and he got submissive. I forgot how you phrased it there. But when I think about when you think about this whole text here, that's what this is all about. Because if you get yourself out of the way, and like just like what you said, allowing God to work through you, mm-hmm. you've got to get yourself out of the way. How do you do that? You got to put others before you. That's right. That's what Christ did. <laughs> really get this. You got, that's what you got to get first. That's it's awesome. not about you. You said that this morning as well. It's not about us. You know, so we got to get ourselves out of the way. And Christ will really God will work through us. But first, we got to get ourselves out of the way. This is a great, great lesson. I appreciate you talking to me so much. I, I appreciate it. That's encouraging to me. Because I, I, the practicality of it is just, it's just amazing. Yeah. I've read this, and like I'm sure many of you have read this over the years. And there's the thing even now Okay, in addition to what Lewis just said, you have to think about others. We're here for that reason, for others, not for ourselves. Mm-hmm. But you have to also be humble. Mm-hmm. Humility has mm-hmm. to come before, because you want, if you're haughty, you aren't going to do that. Right. Put others before yourself. And you're going to put yourself first. You know what, any of those reasons that, that have been enumerated, think of it this way. You're blocking your blessing. You're blocking your own blessing. There's a scripture that teaches a husband who doesn't treat his wife right. This is for you sisters, man. He says, he says <laughs> I heard some brothers back here. Uh, he says, when you don't treat your wife properly, 
Your husband wants his blessing. She can do this. His prayers are Do you see that? Mm -hmm. And so there's a connection between doing right and being blessed by God. When most of us think of humility, we don't like it because we see somebody getting over on us. Mm. Well, if I'm humble, then he's going to run over me. <laughs> That's not how it works. Short term, long term. Now, 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 now let, let me clarify. Don't let anybody run over me. <laughs> let's, let's, let's not take the word of God and, and use it um, embarrassingly. Let's, let's not say this is something because. You know, Brother Clark said, I got to be a doormat. I'm not saying you got to be a doormat. <laughs> what I'm saying is, you put others before yourself. And if you do that, that's servitude. That's, that's really the mindset Christ is dealing with you. Think about it. You're eating dinner, and a man is going to lie on you and turn you in to be killed, and one is going to deny you. But you take a towel and you wash their feet before it happens. Isn't that something? Mm -hmm. I know what you're about to do. Isn't that something? Mm -hmm. We got some people that know they don't mean us any good. Mm -hmm. But you know what? When I know people who don't mean me any good, usually the physical brain says, you know what? Avoid. Avoid. The spiritual brain says, serve them anyway. Mm -hmm. You never lose a blessing coming in second. Matter of fact, you gain more blessing that way. You do things with people, they don't do it back to you and say thank you. That's okay. I get my thank yous from up here. Don't bother me. But I'm growing and I'm letting patience have her perfect work. Wow. You know, and God is very patient with us and, and he you know, if he would strike us the time we did the first sin, you know, we wouldn't have a chance. Right. But you know, when you're humble and you treat people I was told back when I was in college, I was very upset about a situation, but uh, one of my teachers said, I'm going to tell you something. When people do those kind of things to you that are backbiting and, and backstabbing, don't respond the way they want you to. Do just the opposite of what they expect you to do. And that will, that will make them wonder, well, I've been, why should not? It, it, it makes them kind of be off, offside mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you can't change a person if you give them back what they give you. Right. I mean, you can only change the person, they, they learn a new way. They may not know how to love other people other than themselves. You gotta show them. It's it's hard for some people, but you gotta be patient with them. Absolutely. And it's not easy, but eventually you might not know it, but it may be two years from now, they may have changed and treating other people better. Mm -hmm. I had a good friend in college. Um, mm -hmm. and this is not to toot my horn, this is just to kind of show you how to be influence people. Um, college playing football, he's my roommate, he played football, uh, drinking, doing all the kind of good stuff. Um, but he, he, he didn't see me drink because no more I don't like to drink. That's, that's not my sin of choice, amen. <laughs> um, but even if it was, I wasn't going to do it. Um, but, but the thing was, over those years in college, he watched me. Uh, I got a call from him maybe about six years ago. He said, Brian, you know, we just had a good you know, laugh about all the time. And he said, you know, man, I'm a, I'm a deacon in my church now. He said, I owe it a lot to, to you. I said, what you mean, man? I said, you know, we never really got into a biblical discussion. We didn't, you know, take him to, you know, third, you know, this or Titus that. He just said, no, no, it's just watching you and seeing how you handled yourself even in college. Mm -hmm. You know, you had every opportunity I had to sneak girls in the dorm. You know, do all that stuff that college kids do, man. What y'all looking at me that tone of voice? That tone of voice. I don't remember at all. Y'all ain't hell, man. Somebody do something, man. I mean, you know some stuff, right? Yeah. You know, just adjust your halo. I know that, that hits you really hard. But, but I'm, sometimes it's not what you preach. It's what you live. It's how you, the Bible says the things Jesus began to teach and do. Some stuff is caught more than it's taught. Mm hmm your life can teach somebody more so than what your mouth teaches. Because sad to say, some of us contradict what we say. Mm -hmm. Girl, I just leave it alone. Mm -hmm. You know, then the next week they see you, you know, I, I gave a piece of my mind. Well, I don't want me to just tell you to leave it alone. <laughs> <laughs> how, how you gonna call me back and give a piece of your mind? <coughs> so
So, so again, this whole lesson is based on transforming ourselves mm -hmm. and, and learning how to take ourselves out of the picture. Okay? Um, look at it. Yes, I'm sorry. I know you're here. I love the preaching. Go ahead. I'll tell y'all to excuse me. Go ahead. Verse 5 in my Bible says, make mm -hmm. your art attitude. Mm -hmm. Make your art attitude that of Christ. I like that. Huh? I like that. Is that all right? I, I said this more. Let your position be your disposition. Mm hmm. Your position should be your disposition. If your disposition is halting, your position is halting. If your disposition is lonely, your position is lonely, but God's going to do something. He's going to elevate you. Now, now watch this. You can write this down. In John chapter 13, verse 15, the Bible says, For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. This is Jesus talking about his disciples. He says, Now that you've seen me do it, you do the same thing. First Peter Chapter 2, verse 21. First Peter, chapter 2, verse 21. This is what Peter says about humility in Christ's example. He says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, doing what? Leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Then, 1 John, chapter 2, verse 6. 1 John chapter 2, verse number 6. Watch what the Bible says here. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he is walked. So again, we find an example after example after example about how we're supposed to live like Christ and live like Christ for Christ. Now, now when we talk about the mind, we have to also talk about uh, who Christ was. In verse number 6, look at verse number 6, look back over to Philippians chapter 2. The Bible says, who? Who was that? Christ. Being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. 